Hello, I'm Victor Strandberg, and we're here for another session in discussing the poetry of T.S. Eliot. Uh, this is the last of the preludes to actually studying the poetry. Uh, we did look at the biography of Eliot. We looked at the extremely important, crucial concept of naturalism. And now I want to put forward a brief discussion of modernism before we take up our first poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Now, modernism is a term that is subject to a ver variety of definitions. For our purpose, I think we will define the term by showing how T.S. Eliot actually used the concept. That is, we will see the precepts of modernism at work in his poetry and thereby define the term as it is useful for us. We'd have to say that modernism is a word that will describe the revolution in poetry propagated most importantly by Ezra Pound and Eliot, working together in both poetry and in their non-fictional essays to promote this idea of a new kind of poetry to suit the modern age. The purpose of the revolution in poetry, or any revolution, Eliot says in one of his essays, is to promote greater realism in literature. The idea being that every generation has its own perspective on reality. They get new sources of information. New events happen to affect the tenor of the age. And all of this must be reflected in a new kind of literature. Uh, a new realism in literature suitable for each generation. In the case of this revolution in poetry, the greater realism affects both the form and the content of modern literature. The content is largely derived from this naturalistic view of life that I described in our last session, and the form would display a number of precepts that I want to offer in a kind of checklist. First, this new realism would involve, T.S. Eliot said in one of his essays, a return to common speech. He declared that Wordsworth had propagated a similar revolution a century earlier, around the year 1800. And there's no doubt that Wordsworth brought forward a return to common speech as against the high style, the inflated Latinate style that he inherited from the writers just preceding him. Writers like Alexander Pope, for example. In T.S. Eliot, we don't see a great deal of common speech, actually, but there is there are some striking instances, and we will note them especially when we get to the wasteland. Second would be a new importance given to metaphor. I described earlier how Aristotle declared that striking off new metaphors is the most important thing for a poet. It's the greatest thing by far for a poet to be a master of metaphor. To strike off new metaphors enabling us to understand the life uh, we are living in a better fashion. Uh, if you elevate the metaphors, they could perhaps become symbols, uh, having more weight, you might say, and importance. But as we go through Eliot's poetry, we'll take note of his mastery of metaphors, of a brilliant new metaphors that he strikes off all along the way. The third feature of this new, more realistic poetry would be psychological realism. We saw, or we will see, Prufrock as a bundle of neurotic inhibitions. Even the name J. Alfred Prufrock suggests that he is a modern man uh, with all the inconveniences that that imposes psychologically. And the type of style that best suits psychological realism would be the stream of consciousness style a term I think that was invented by William James 
in his Principles of Psychology back in 1890, uh, but which is deployed here by Eliot in a new and remarkably realistic way. T.S. Eliot declared in one of his essays that in the past, poets were told to look into your hearts and write. Eliot declared that in our time, that's not good enough. You don't, on, don't only look into the heart, you look into your nervous system, into the digestive tracts even, to get the materials for modern poetry, to get the proper perspective on those materials. The third feature of this new, or excuse me, this would be the fourth feature of this new type of poetry, would be the organization in the fashion of music. T.S. Eliot wrote an essay around 1950 called The Music of Poetry. He does not say that music and poetry sound the same. The idea is that they are organized in a similar fashion. What poetry and music most exhibit uh, together, in Eliot's view, is the use of recurring motifs, uh, what you see in both poetry and music in modern times, and sometimes the use of counterpoint, playing off themes or motifs or images against each other. The fifth of these features of the new poetry is um, what's, what I'm calling the movie camera technique. In uh, The Love Song of Jail for Proof Rock, a primitive movie camera actually appears as if the magic lantern throws the nerves in patterns on the screen. And in the technique of the movies, one of the features, as I understand it, is the jump cut, which is to say you'll see uh, a scene develop in a movie, and then suddenly we end it and we move immediately with no bridge or transition to the next scene. Now in Proof Rock, as we'll see, you do get the jump cut, as we see Proof Rock walking through the streets of the city to begin with, cut, then we are at a party where the women come and go talking to Michelangelo. The sixth of these new precepts in modern poetry is something really that's quite venerable. It's been used since the beginning of poetry back in Greek times. The use of allusion, which is to say, referring to literature of the past as one writes in the present. Citing passages from the literature of the past or certainly multifold references to the literature of the past. Now, it is in this fashion in which T.S. Eliot is truly multicultural. For him, this was not just a political ideology. He strove mightily, did a lot of intellectual work to accomplish the real thing, multicultural literature, so that he does cite passages in Latin, in Greek, in medieval Italian, uh, even in Sanskrit, in the wasteland, languages that he studied and in which uh, the literature uh, that he studied uh, came uh, to play an important role in his own poetry. Uh, we see allusions to the Bible, to the classics, to the uh, Vedas of ancient Ind India, to Shakespeare, uh, and to more recent people like Hermann Hesse, for example, a contemporary that he cites in the wasteland. We move next to the seventh of these precepts, the idea of organic form, which is to say that every poem is unique in its form, its structure, uh, like a plant that grows. No other plant will ever be exactly identical. Each poem then has its own unique form or shape. There's no standard rhyme, no metrical patterns, no ballad forms, odes, blank verse, or the like. Now, Eliot does use those forms from time to time when they prove useful to his purpose. Uh, but overall, his view of serious poetry of his own major poems 
is that every poem had to be radically different from the previous poem he had published. And I think he was true to that vision of his calling, that his poems, his major poems, do have a distinct, unique form uh, as they come on uh, to, in display uh, in their own time. An eighth precept of this new poetry is the widespread prevalence of irony in the tone, sometimes deepening to outright sarcasm. Irony is based on a discrepancy of some kind. It could be a discrepancy between appearance and reality. In T.S. Eliot's case, I think it's more often a discrepancy between what one might hope for, what one needs, and what reality offers. Uh, that perspective traces back to naturalism very largely. And the last thing I would offer as a precept for this new modernist poetry is something that Eliot displayed throughout his life, uh, but which we are going to borrow from William Butler Yeats. Yeats's comment that rhetoric is a quarrel with other people, poetry is a quarrel with oneself. Uh, he is not the only one to come to that perspective. William Faulkner, in his Nobel Prize speech of 1950, said, the heart in conflict with itself is the only thing worth writing about. We'll certainly see in the poetry of T.S. Eliot that this precept, a conflict with himself, is at the very heart of Eliot's work, of his achievement, actually as we proceed through the entire length of his career. Uh, we'll end this session now, and we'll proceed next with an actual poetry, beginning with the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock.